Hi, this is Clyde. We're here in Indianapolis. It's Good Friday, 2020. I'm going to read a poem by John Finley, The Hoosier's Nest. He wrote it about 1830, and the Indianapolis Journal published it in 1833, actually January 1st, 1833, as the carrier's address it distributed as a New Year's greetings. The word was widely familiar then, or Finley would not have used it, although he spelled it Hoosier, H-O-O-S-H-E-R, instead of H-O-O-S-I-E-R, but anyway... Here's my go at it, The Hoosier's Nest, by John Finley. I'm taught the language of the schools, nor versed in scientific rules. The humble bard may not presume the literate to illume, or classic cadences indite, attuned to tickle ears polite. Contented if his strains may pass the ordeal of the common mass and raise an anti-critic smile, the brow of labor to beguile. But ever as his mind delights to follow fancy's airy flights, some object of terrestrial mien uncourteously obtrudes between, and rudely scatters to the winds the tangled threads of thought he spins. Yet, why invoke imagination? to picture out a new creation when nature with a lavish hand has formed a more than fairy land. For us, an El Dorado real, surpassing even the ideal. Then who can view the glorious West with all her hopes for coming time and hoard his feelings unexpressed in poetry or prose or rhyme? What mind and matter unrevealed shall unborn ages her disclose. What latent treasures long concealed but disinterred from dark repose. Here science shall impel her car o'er blended valley, hill and plain, while liberty's bright natal star shines twinkling on her own domain. Yea, land of the west, thou art happy and free. And thus evermore may thy hardy sons be, whilst thy ocean-like prairies are spread far and wide, or a tree or thy forest shall tower in pride. Blessed Indiana, in thy soil are found the sure rewards of toil, where honest poverty and worth may make a paradise on earth. With feelings proud we can contemplate the rising glory of our state, nor take offense at application of its good-natured appellation. Our hearty yeomany can smile. All tourists of Seargard Isle, or wits who traveled at the gallop, like Basil Hall or Miss Trollope. Tea is true among the crowds that roam, to seek for fortune or a home. It happens that we often find empiricism of a kind. A strutting fop who boasts of knowledge acquired at some far eastern college is, expects to take us by surprise and dazzle our astonished eyes. He boasts of learning, skill, and talents which in the scale would Andes balance. Cuts widening swaths from day to day and in a month he runs away. Not thus the honest son of toil, who settles here to till the soil, and with intentions just and good, acquires an ample livelihood. He is, and not the little great, the bone and sinew of the state. With six-horse team and one-horse cart, we hail here from every part. And some you'll see, sans shoes or socks on, with snake pole and yoke of oxen, Others with pack horse, dog, and rifle make emigration quite a trifle. The emigrant is soon located in Hoosier life initiated, a wrecks a cabin in the woods wherein he stows his household goods. At first, round logs and clappered roof 
with puncheon floor, quite carpet-proof, and paper windows oiled and neat, his edifice is then complete. When four clay balls in form of plummet adorn his wooden chimney's summit, ensconced in this, let those who can find out a truly happier man. The little youngsters rise around him, so numerous they quite astound him, each with an axe or wheel in hand, an instinct to subdue the land. Ere long the cabin disappears, a spacious mansion next he rears. His fields seem widening by stealth, an index of increasing wealth. And when the hives of Hoosiers swarm, to each is given a noble farm. These are the seedlings of the state, the stamina to make the great. T is true. Her population varies. Find advocations multifarious. But having said so much, T would seem no derogation to my theme. Were I to circumscribe the space to picture a single case, and if my muse be not seraphic, I trust you'll find her somewhat graphic. I'm told in writing somewhere west, a stranger found a Hoosier's nest. In other words, a Buckeye cabin, just big enough to hold Queen Mab in. Its situation, low but airy, was on the borders of a prairie, and fearing he might be benighted, he hailed the house and then alighted. The Hoosier met him at the door. Their salutations soon were o'er. He took the stranger's horse aside and to a sturdy sapling tied. Then having stripped the saddle off, he fed him in a sugar trough. The stranger stooped to enter in. The entrance closed with a pin and manifested strong desire to seat him by the log heap fire. Where half a dozen Hoosieroons with mush and milk, tin cups and spoons, white heads, bare feet, and dirty faces seemed much inclined to keep their places. But Madam, anxious to display her rough but undisputed sway, her offspring to the ladder led and cuffed the youngsters up to bed, invited shortly to partake of venison, milk, and johnny cake. The stranger made a hearty meal and glances round the room would steal. One side was lined with divers' garments. The other spread with skins of varmints. Dried pumpkins overhead were strong, where venison hams in plenty hung. Two rifles placed above the door. Three dogs lay stretched upon the floor. In short, the domicile was rife with specimens of Hoosier life. The host who centered his affections on game and range and quarter sections, discoursed his weary guests for hours, till somnus all composing powers of sublunary cares bereft him. And then, no matter how the story ended, the application I intended is from the famous Scottish poet who seemed to feel as well as know it that beardly sheaths and clever hizzies are bred in seek away as this is. That is the end of The Hoosier's Nest, a poet by John Finley. Thanks for listening.